Good. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, my name is Tina Stanislavski. I am one of the co-chairs of the um, K-12 Educational Facilities Knowledge Committee. Um, and I also have my other co-chair, Bob Bell, here. Um, morning. We are um, happy to welcome two fellow principals from my office, HMFH, uh, Pip Lewis and Laura Wernick. Um, they're right up on the screen. Hello. You can see my screen. Um, so we're going to have a discussion this morning about how we as educational facility planners and designers can help do our part to combat racial injustice um, through our work. So what we'd like to discuss are ways to promote more equitable distribution of resources um, across the state of Massachusetts and specifically targeting poor urban areas. Um, we know that these urban areas are often districts of color and also have the most outdated facilities. So how can we help this population of students and teachers? So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Pip Lewis and Laura Wernick from my office and they're gonna take it away. Thanks Tina. Um, I'm just gonna get started. We do want this to be a, a, a conversation. Maybe, can you um, unshare your screen and maybe people yeah. can see each other a little bit more, more readily. Um, you know, I think those of us who are in school design world, and uh, certainly I feel very deeply that, that schools are um, a starting point, a stepping stone, an entry point into um, a decent life in our society. And um, since that's been a, a firm belief of mine, I don't believe that architecture can create, can solve uh, racial injustice and systemic racism, but I think that we can uh, approach our, our work in ways that can expand opportunities and provide, uh, make, uh, help assure that everyone is give, given an equal uh, access to those early stepping stones. So this work is very near and dear to me. Uh, Pip and I have long kind of had these little backroom discussions about, uh, you know, how can we make our schools better? How, how can we make them more equitable? Are people being left out? Is there anything that our work can do to, to, to broaden um, opportunities? And then I think with the, the Black Lives um, Movement and the George Floyd uh, murder, um, obviously I think for most of us that, that, that discussion became more urgent and uh, uh, faced us more, more frontally and, and our discussions got a little bit more targeted. And for us, uh, a lot of our work is focused, most of our, our work with HMFH is focused on school design and construction. And uh, we are working both in cities and in, in urban, in suburban and urban situations. And certainly our urban schools um, can be more, can have certain challenges. We know that urban situations where uh, often high percentage of minorities uh, live just from their geographically have challenges that, that need to be overcome. There are, uh, there tends to be uh, more air pollution from, from heavier traffic. That's just a reality of, of living in a, uh, an urban situation. There tends to be higher uh, noise and acoustical issues uh, there because of, again, because of uh, vehicular traffic, because of airplanes, because of ambulances, uh, that noise levels are higher in urban situations. Uh, we know that many urban situations, many urban uh, communities have a, a real shortage of available land and specifically available green space. So there are many urban schools that are built you know, uh, lot line to lot line with very little access to, to green space. And that, you know, research has indicated that green space is, is crucial for uh, healthy development and learning. Uh, we know that uh, communities, urban communities often don't, or maybe I'll flip flop then and say that the suburban communities are often able to uh, uh, bring more resources. They're just, they're, they're greater resources for their, for their, for their school age children and for their families, whether they're 
swimming pools or uh, libraries or better uh, after school facilities. There, there tend to be more resources to support students and families in uh, suburban areas than there are in, in uh, many of our urban situations. So we kind of focused in on those four points, the uh, air quality, um, the acoustics, the um, access to green space, and community program space. Uh, and asked, okay, how do we, how do we help assure that a, a child uh, in an urban situation has an equal start in life, at least through those four, um, four access points, four, four important parts in terms of health and learning and all the, the acoustics. I think I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, so I don't think I need to say too much on this, but certainly acoustics impacts learning. A child's ability to learn is impaired if the, if the acoustics are not good and indoor air quality uh, impacts a child's health and ability to learn if the indoor air quality is not good. So I'm kind of assuming everyone's kind of uh, understands that as a basic, as, as a basic, as, as a basis for this. Uh, so we started, and Pip, I, jump in Pip, if you want to add anything yeah, at any point here. I, I, I will add to those four points, something we've, we've talked about, but uh, didn't quite make it to the points because it doesn't, once it, students are in the school doesn't affect them, but it is certainly a challenge for schools in urban areas. And that's really the, the problems of what any, the difficulty of finding sites and what any site that you find has been used for in the past, which means what are the challenges of hazardous materials and, and abatement of, uh, uh, of sites. Um, and um, we're, Working with a um, um, a with a school in Boston um, right now that has just made it very clear to me as I've worked with s several suburban schools and then working with an urban school what some of these challenges are that that uh, Laura has articulated and working through how to how to mitigate them in the design of the school as as best as possible. Um, uh, it, it, we, uh, after a, a 10 year search for a site, uh, we found a site in about simultaneously as we were, the city was agreeing that that would be the site, uh, newspaper articles were coming out saying that um, this location um, was the most polluted air, air quality in the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And so as we designed the school, we had to design for great air quality um, we, it is, a, as Laura said, the lot line school. Everything's built out to the lot line. So we're looking at ways of um, occupying rooftop areas for educational space and um, uh, various things uh, along those lines as we go through the design. And so we thought it would be an interesting conversation amongst architects who do this to uh, talk about um, what um, things that, uh, ideas that people might have, things that people have seen that might uh, uh, help to mitigate the inequities in school construction, in schools that are uh, aimed at minority uh, populations and economically disadvantaged uh, um, populations. And how um, we working together, perhaps with the MSBA, might tweak things a, a little bit in order to um, um, uh, uh, help to correct uh, some of those inequities. So just to add in to what Pip said, we've, we've started, we've initiated some discussions uh, with the MSBA. We've had two good discussions with Jack McCarthy, who's joined us today, and there are a number of people here from the MSBA, and I really appreciate it. They've, they've all been very open and uh, sincerely uh, want to hear our perspective um, the MSBA, they, the, 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 um, the voice I've been hearing from the MSBA is um, this agency was, in, was created to um, make 
the school construction industry, school construction process better for everyone. And we've now been, it's been in, in the, the, the um, legislation that initiated it has been in effect for 15 years and now is a good time to be thinking about these things and, and bringing to the forefront um, things that are not happening that could be different, uh, changes that could be made to, to create uh, a better sense of equity. So there's a, a great openness and uh, willingness to uh, jump into this and, and have these discussions to see what can be, uh, what can be changed. Pip talks about tweaking. I talk about uh, aspirational changes, but somewhere in between, <laughs> I'm sure we'll find some things that, that uh, can be accomplished. Um, it's, a, it's a big issue. It goes well beyond the MSBA's purview in many, many ways. There's, there's so much systemic, uh, so many systemic challenges that um, one agency can't do it all, but I think the MSBA is very open to, to using their powers and their authorities to um, see what, what can be changed to, to address these issues. So we're very fortunate to have them at the table today and um, that they've been so open and uh, eager to hear our input. Um, we can just talk about some of the things we've come up with. These are just some ideas, but we're, I think the point of this discussion is to uh, really get some feedback on what Pip and I have been thinking about, you know, talking about back and forth amongst ourselves, between ourselves and get a broader audience to be thinking about and um, chiming in on what are the possibilities here. Let me just, uh, for a second, I learned, I because just... I, sorry, Pip, I missed okay. the beginning of this to say that if you open up your chat, and you want to ask any questions or have comments on what Pip and Laura are talking about, you could write it in there and then we'll call on you because there's a pretty big group and I can't see everybody. So please use the chat. And also you can sign up for your um, credits for CEUs in that as well. And I just, all I wanted to do is add that I don't want, we don't want to put words in uh, MSBA's mouth. We just had a couple of conversations with uh, uh, Jack and people um, and it, it was suggested that we talk to a broader um, range of architects to come up with, with ideas. Um, and so we're, we're um, brainstorming, uh, coming up with ideas. We will f uh, float some of them with the MSBA. Um, the MSBA hasn't made any promises to us at, at this point, I don't think. And Jack, you can correct me if you... <laughs> if that doesn't sound correct to you. No, the, the, I, I think you both described where we are very uh, accurately. Um, you know, the one thing that I always stress is we have a very prescriptive statute. So things that we want to change, we would have to get, um, you know, legislative uh, agreement on that for many of them. Um, but, you know, I'm all ears. Uh, you know, it, it, it as, as, uh, Laura said the statute's been around since 2004. Um, we are writing a report to the legislature and they asked us if there's changes we wanna make. So the, uh, the timing of this is, is actually pretty good. So we're all ears. Uh, I can't promise you anything for a number of reasons. One is, you know, I work for a board of directors and two, I have a statute that tells me what I can and can't do. So, uh, you know, what I do promise is I'm all ears and, uh, no idea is a bad one. So um, I'll mute again and just listen. And also, I, I know at least there's uh, at least one uh, engineer here. There may be others that I'm not aware of, but uh, Ed Dolan from Bala is here and, and uh, your input and others is also more than welcome. The, the, as both Pip and I have said, the, the um, indoor air quality issue is obviously a, a long-term and very serious issue in all of this. So please don't feel... Uh, threatened by being surrounded by architects. So, uh, <laughs> no, thanks, Laura. I will, I will I'll definitely chime in if, uh, if anybody has any questions or anything to say. So I, I've posted the bullets that, that Pip and I have come up with. Um, and I'll try and just go through them very briefly. Um, the, the first one is something that actually Jack had, had brought to our attention. Uh, right now, as school districts are writing up their statements of interest, there's a priority listing of it, how, how, how their statements of, of interest are ranked. And I think that um, uh, aged out HVA systems is about fifth on the list. So simply moving that up higher on the list could mean that 
school systems who have poor HVAC systems could be uh, considered more readily for, uh, for um, to be brought into the program. Um, the reimbursement formula, that seems like a, a, a good target one way or the other um, to, could be considered to reimburse urban communities with either higher construction costs or lower uh, communities with either higher construction costs or lower property values more gener generously than other communities. Um, should the cap on current cap on dollars per square foot uh, be raised in communities with majority min minority communities? Um, uh, incentive uh, point language could be modified for um, overcoming specific challenges such as air pollution or noise pollution. If you were, lived in a community where there was your site had documentation of high air pollution or high noise pollution, could you be uh, granted high, uh, greater incentive points? That kind of approach. Um, we talked about the green space, and right now there there are regulations constraining purchase of non-contiguous properties. Um, could that be altered in any way? Uh, could uh, communities be given some credit for upgrading parks that are in their neighborhoods, but maybe not suitable for for school, suitable at, you know, in the, at the moment for, for uh, school recreation or, or physical education? Um, can there be dedicated monies for rooftop um, gardens and green space that can be you know, really serious green uh, 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 plant, plant materials that can be sustained and maintained over time and won't you know, just turn to dust after the season. Um, sometimes the nature of urban schools, if you're starting, if you're on a small site and you have to go vertically, the net to gross, the standard net to gross uh, ratios can be extremely challenging to meet. Can there be some leverage, some easing of those net to gross ratios on sites where vertical construction is, is necessitated. And then, you know, in terms of program changes, um, can there be a way to have input from, my, from the communities to de determine non-standard program additions that would have community-wide benefit um, for the students, for the families, and the communities? Again, these, sc these schools are uh, has, schools have traditionally not just been a place for learning, they're community places. They're places where the, the community can come together. And in many of these urban situations, they're the only public uh, investment in, in the community. So how do we take, how do we leverage, is there a way even outside of the MSBA to leverage the school construction to provide needed resources for the families and for the community at large? You know, libraries, after school spaces, uh, community kitchen, community theater, swimming pools. You know, back in the day, the, the state used to help fund swimming pools, believe it or not. Uh, swimming was considered a, um, you know, a, a necessity. Uh, health services, uh, you know, can there be set-asides to support efforts to create those spaces? So these are the kinds of things that, um, that we've come up with, and we really are now looking for for other thoughts, either feedback on these ideas or, 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 other, uh, or other thoughts. Uh, and I don't know, I think there was some chat. Tina, are you checking on the chat stuff? Yep, there's a, there's a few comments and questions from um, Rebecca Berry. Rebecca, do you wanna unmute and, and talk about your comments here? Uh, sure, so there's Most one, uh, hi. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Rebecca Berry from Feingold Alexander Architects. One thing to note, we have recently completed two buildings for the Elliott School in the North End. Um, these are not MSBA projects. I'll just put, I'll put that out there right away. They were with City of Boston PFD, just straight city funding. But I think what's really germane and interesting to this discussion is that they are two separate buildings. They are part of one school. They also have a separate original facility on Charter Street. Um, they move the kids back and forth throughout the day. And uh, the way that, the, um, this is an innovation school too. So the way that this works as well is that there are a ton of partnerships, um, but that's really all come from within the school. And I'm wondering if there's a way that, you know, with state funding processes that these kinds of partnerships, there could be assistance for those 
for these urban schools. And also I do just wanna point out that this is a very, very, very successful school. Um, it doesn't look anything like, you know, like a big, you know, contiguous school building. It's these three small buildings spread out. Um, we placed facilities kind of in different parts. They, um, they use a lot of the public parks in the area for recreation purposes and they've worked that out with the Boston Parks Department, with a tennis program, things like that. So it, it sort of falls under the, it takes a village mantra, which I think right. really applies to a lot of these urban schools, but it's, it's very successful. And I think some of that could be used as kind of ways to talk about alternate ways of thinking about the urban school. Yeah, we just, uh, I've been doing some visioning and, and planning for a uh, elementary school in uh, St. John, New Brunswick. And uh, same kind of thing that the community nonprofits, uh, health services really came together with, with the city. There, was, there were, there were uh, community events specifically to get players together to talk about what these facilities should be within the school. It was never considered simply a, a school. It was really uh, designed, the, the, the impetus behind the design was to be able to provide full wraparound services for the kids and community programming space for the for the for the entire community, so what it was exactly the kind of thing you're talking about, Rebecca. But it was um, a community-wide initiative, and different players were brought to the table and were able to contribute in in some ways uh, to start to create this singular vision. Well, the the interesting thing I think about the Elliot is that it actually really came from within the school. Um, and, you know, she Tracy, uh, who's the principal, has really sort of made this happen over time but she's had to sort of bootstrap it. And I think if there was a system, you know, at the, again, at the funding level, you know, with the municipality, with MSCA that could support those kinds of efforts, then I think that would talk to, to equity, uh, you know, so that it's not so just dependent on, you know, the folks who are involved with like that particular school to do it, but that it's, it's spread like more widely across the community. That really is speaks to one of the challenges of Boston, is the LA schools in Boston. There are certain schools in Boston that are doing very well. They're uh, engaged in a, a lot of uh, partnerships and uh, um, um, programs that, that you mentioned. And it is frequently driven by a particular powerhouse, let's say, at the school or vision for that school or reputation that that school has. And the problem is the, the, the way that inequity comes into that system is that it isn't system-wide, like you're saying, it's coming from within. And so there are a lot of schools, there's a lot of kids in, in Boston who are coming up without those same advantages that you're getting at the Elliott School. Um, and um, it would really, help equity, specifically equity, if that sort of approach could be treated on a more uh, system-wide uh, basis um, by, in this case, the city of Boston, but by other uh, com communities also. So, the, and of course you will find that the, the many of the, the, the people who are the most, let's say, disadvantaged, the uh, minorities, the, the kids who have the least hope for, um, for getting ahead, but they're the ones who are going to the schools that um, are not getting the support and things like that. People may be getting uh, at, at the Elliott School or at certain other city of Boston schools. And the real question is, how do we help everybody, not just the people who get into certain chosen schools? Can yeah, I just I'm wondering jump, jump in just a, the uh, historical reference? So I, I, I wonder if I'll, I'm probably one of the few people on this call that actually went to a public high school in Boston. Um, and I went there during the seventies and, you know, during the seventies was when busing uh, came about. And one of the things that they did that I thought was pretty smart and till, till Becker said that I, I kind of forgot about it, but they had these trilateral partnerships and they did it at the high school level. So every high school was given two partners. So my school was given uh, Wellesley College and the Federal Reserve Bank. And it was, it was, you know, I don't know how to set it up at the elementary school level, but for us, you know, 
I get to I get to go to a summer program at Wellesley College, and you know I never would have got to do that without that. And I also uh, we had a lot of uh, internships that were at the Federal Reserve, so like we were exposed to things that we otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to, and that was just done at the at the city level. Um, maybe they could you know think about putting a program like that together because we really reaped a lot of benefits from that. Uh, in my day. And I guess I just told everybody how old I am. <laughs> uh, I'm right there with you, with you, Jack. Uh, I, I think is another way to look at it. I think the idea is, is, a, is a powerful one. And is there a way to incentivize communities to develop partnerships, uh, you know, urban communities to develop part, these types of partnerships to be part of, to be welcomed into the programs that we're looking for, that the MSBA is looking for um, cities to help discuss how they're going to address these issues to be part of the, to be, be welcomed in, and then you'll be incentivized to do it successfully or something like that, so that there is a little bit of a stick and carrot um, aspect to it. Or is there another, you know, way to do that legislatively to um, incentivize communities to develop different types of partnerships with their, with their uh, communities. I think Laura just froze. <laughs> um, but let me um, uh, ask about a, a different portion of the Elliot. It's, it's different locations. Do you, is there open space incorporated with that? Um, and the reason why, no, no, it, no it's, it's, about, I mean, it's really come out because I don't yeah. actually know. I don't know if open space is connected with it, but. So it's, it, it's, it's largely not. So the one, two of the locations, so again, it's three locations, right? Mm -hmm. But one school. So two of them are lot line to lot line, one of which we developed on Salem Street. The commercial street site, which was most recently finished last year, has, has, a site. Um, it's very tight. There's some parking and we did manage to shoehorn in a small schoolyard. And I mean, 40 by 20, you know, yeah. like there's, there's yeah. one main structure. Right. But, um, but again, they use every, every bit of the site and we do have the advantage of that that site was next to Langone park, which is one of the reasons why the city purchased it. Um, uh -huh. So the students will be, once the construction is finished there, they will be using Langone park more And there's a tennis court on one side. Um, it, we put in a very small multi-purpose space in the Salem Street building and the students do go there in the winter. So again, they, they walk, right? They, they walk the few blocks like up the street, do their thing, and then they, and then they come back um, to the other location. Um, it, you know, it's, it, it's tricky and it requires a lot of coordination, but they do manage to do it. Um, and in a place like the North End, there's, I mean, there's just no such thing as open space, right? It just, it just doesn't exist until you get onto mm -hmm. that, onto that water side at all. Um, so they really have to use, have to use the, um, the community resources to deal with that. But I mean, there's places where this, we're running into the same thing, you know, I mean, Roxbury, Mad Pan, Hyde Park, it's, you know, where do you, where do you put a school, right? Um, I mean, Dearborn was, shoe, was shoehorned in, right? Uh, same way mm -hmm. into a, into a very tight area, so. Yeah, what we're, uh, uh, trying to do with Quincy Upper because they are a lot line school. They're being built on, uh, you know, new high school, middle, middle high school for 650 students being built on less than an acre of land would be unheard of <laughs> for most of our clients. Um, and so we're really uh, planning the school for a significant rooftop area for educational space. It wasn't really big enough, frankly, for recreational space, which is our first idea, but uh, a series of outdoor classrooms and um, uh, student gardens and things like that were, were able to, to, to do, to give them some outdoor space. Um, but it, it got us thinking, wouldn't it be great if when the city builds a school, did it, even if it's a lot line school, that it thinks about like with the Langone Park, uh, um, um, sort of adapting a piece of open space to become sort of the home field uh, for, for that school and using maybe some of the development money 
to um, make the uh, whatever open space they are able to purchase appropriate for that age of, of, of student uh, and, and to just also just bring things up uh, to uh, today's standard in terms of modernization, play, play equipment, lighting, and things like that. Um, we are not doing that at Quincy Upper, but it really, as, I, as you work on it, you see the differences with, with the, the suburban schools, the, uh, the exurban schools that we work on. And you, you start to ask these questions, well, could you do this? Could you consider that? Um, and uh, it, it's, you, you, can, you can see just lots of differences and lots of challenges. So there's so some Dory. You, yeah, I should, I'm sorry. I'm just going to have Dory talk a little bit, maybe about some of the challenges that that uh, Holyoke faced, and some of the decisions that we're having having had to be made to to move forward. Sure. Thanks, Laura. I, I guess I was just thinking as an architect, wanting to to valorize the idea of of um, a process that's integrative and focused on health, um, and you know, sort of in the same way that in our process we assess educational needs very carefully. Um, for us in Holyoke, it was really evident right away because the city was in receivership um, and had a lot of great partnerships established in the community that we um, were directed right away to collaborate with Holyoke Health Center. Um, and in, through that process, we began to unearth a lot of really important statistics around health issues, um, um, uh, nutritional issues, um, trauma, um, all of which strongly influenced our design approach. Um, and I found that to be incredibly helpful to the process. It led to things as a committee uh, that were really appreciated and, and understood because it was an educational process for the entire building committee, including issues of material choice, HVAC selection, green space, all those things. Um, people came to really see them through multiple lenses, education and health being the two central ones. Um, but unfortunately, that was a hard message to communicate to the larger community. And it did require that we cut some of the enrichment spaces that we might have wanted to present um, in order to afford um, an expanded um, you know, health clinic in the school um, or to afford the additional space for breakfast in the classroom. So there are these kind of trade-offs implicitly right now that it would be great to kind of see it as see the distinctions of needs in these communities and find a way to kind of protect these things that ultimately have benefit year round in the community and kind of bring a healthy body of students to school next season, you know. Um, so uh, we, we found that need for um, the school to operate year round was already, you know, well established and understood and to support it as a heating and cooling center in a, a, in a dense urban community. Those types of things um, were priorities. Um, to the community as a whole, but were hard to kind of necessarily wrap into our approach financially. So they did end up tipping up our cost per square foot in a way that, you know, the community just couldn't support. So I think the flip side, and Jack's heard all about the Holyoke folk and their view of, of reimbursement formulas is very, very difficult in those communities because they can't, they don't have the tolerance for, you know, a dollar over what the state's going to give them and they're, they're just so tapped out. So it, it has to be approached from both directions, I think. Dory, this is, is, a is there any question. documentation from? Go ahead, Laura. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I'm just going to say, I was just uh, talking to the, to, to the MSBA. Is there documentation that would be easy to put together uh, as maybe as part of your report to the legislature about uh, dollars spent on students in, in school construction, spent on students in uh, urban communities versus suburban communities? I'm, I'm just curious if there ha if there's any historical data about ha how the the money is flowing in terms of um, dollars per student. If there'd be any, God, I, if there'd be ev any evidence there that might speak to yeah, Dory's that, that, point. I, I, I'm already that's already p planned as part of the report. Oh great! We're looking at it by reimbursement. It, it's it's the same thing. We're doing it by reimbursement rate, and and you're going to get to the same answer. Because obviously, the higher the reimbursement rate, the the poorer the, the community. The need. So. Yeah. So, so, but it it, it uh, these are the communities that um, 
you know, have the greatest need and often have the fewest resources to to um, leverage their their opportunity. Yeah, and I'm also looking at it as you know what 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 do the poorer communities end up spending per square foot? Do they you know are they acting like everybody else or are they at the, the low side? You know, or are they at, at the high side? There's, you know, some people would accept would expect maybe they're at the high side because they don't have to put as much in. But if you know the realization is you expect them to be on the low side because they don't have enough to put in. Um, but the, the truth is, in looking at it, they're all over the place, just like everybody else as far as square foot. But it's, mm -hmm. it's something we're definitely looking at. I mean, it's something we see that, you know, uh, when you work with a community that has lower means, your, some building committees are, are going to pressure for the bare minimum, um, and they're not going to address a lot of these issues that we're talking about. And other committees are going to feel that they should be protecting the, the health and educational needs of their students, and they're going to go higher. So I'm not surprised it's all over the map. I think, you know, that's, that's kind of where like, having the state and the legislature prioritize, you know, what minimum are they willing to accept these communities going to would be helpful because we've all seen very poorly constructed, poorly designed schools in the olden days um, where the community uh, went for the bare minimum and those schools don't necessarily always last very well either. So it, it seems like it's helpful to set some, some boundaries as to how low they can go, you know. <laughs> um, I, and I can comment on a, a funny sort of reverse incentive that, that can happen as we're talking about communities with high reimbursement rates, um, just about every community I work with, regardless of whether they're interested in being green or energy efficient or not, more and more are fortunately, but they always want to get those two extra reimbursement points from the MSBA. And so we're always um, uh, you know, going for you know, lead silver or, or mass chips or whatever it might be. Um, and our recent uh, new school in Chelsea, uh, because Chelsea was already up at the maximum reimbursement um, at 80%, the client in Chelsea had no interest in becoming uh, LEED certified or, or mass chips or anything because they weren't getting any additional money for it. Um, and that was an odd sort of um, uh, counter incentive that sort of, you know, no one would anticipate that was worked into the, um, into the system. Um, and hopefully most of our communities would think more, more um, holistically, uh, largely <laughs> holistically than two extra incentive points in terms of uh, the energy uh, and sustainability of their, of their buildings. Um, but that's, but I, I think it does show it does show how important those incentive points are that if people if there's a little bit more that they could gain these communities most communities and I, I, you know, I think uh, if it were allowed if Chelsea were allowed to have gotten an additional two beyond their max then they would have gone for it too I think those incentive points are uh, really <laughs> great incentives that they uh, it can really help school systems um, enhance their schools in, in really important ways if they're structured. It, it just seems like they're a, a ripe opportunity to help with these issues, to use incentive points, particularly in urban communities, to assure that certain things are achieved that may not be necessary in other, in other communities. Yeah, Laura, I, I'm it, just curious. Go ahead, Ed, please. Yeah, I was just, uh, just going to say, uh, Pip, before you jumped in, I was thinking the same exact thing with respect to the additional um, the two percent based on achieving certain uh, energy goals in in excess of of the code, um, and one thing that's interesting now for us as engineers is we're thinking forward on how we can still try to achieve those increased levels of energy performance versus the enhanced indoor air quality, which is being driven a lot by increased outdoor air for you know situations like addressing covid and measures measures to address you know those types of viruses and and um it's going to be more difficult it's much more difficult for us to achieve those levels of energy performance um 
with the strategies we're going to use to in, increase the uh, air quality in these schools. So what I'm, one thing I'm wondering is, is as we go forward, maybe that reimbursement um, looks at it more holistically with respect to not only strict energy performance guidelines, but also total um, systems ability to improve health, the, you know, health with respect to air, indoor air quality. So it's not just a, a strict energy number because it's going to be difficult to achieve both. Yeah, we just uh, l later this afternoon, I'll be having a conference call with one of our former clients looking at, you know, with our uh, mechanical HVAC engineers, how, looking at how we can make their existing system less efficient, but maybe more COVID uh, right. friendly or, or right. yeah. exactly. I mean, we, you know, when, when we first, when the pandemic first started happening, you know, everything we were talking about was like counterintuitive to what we've been talking about for the past 20 years with increasing en energy performance, you know, the, everything we're doing to increase uh, indoor air quality goes against that. So we're going to, we're really going to have to look at strategies that can optimize both. Mm -hmm. And, and it may be that we, we, you really want to build in flexibility so that when you're going through a certain time like this, you can uh, have your systems well, operate yeah. in a certain way. And then in other times, which I hope are normal times, um, uh, they, they, they operate uh, much more e efficiently. Yeah, um, <laughs> very, very true. Very true. And one other thing I just wanted to add quickly is when you were talking about um, schools being built to lot lines in urban areas, a lot of the systems that we would have to implement to try to get close to achieving, you know, zero net energy goals or things of that nature, which are prevalent in a lot of the school construction nowadays, require either land area or significant roof area. And if those, if one's not available and the other is looking to be repurposed for um, other, you know, other program needs, it, it's difficult. It is. Yeah, I finally have a client that wants to, uh, but uh, uh, want to incorporate a, a large PV array uh, into their building, not as a third party uh, uh, lease, but as it, actually as a part of the construction. Oh, and so it nice. turns out we don't have any roof area because we're using it all for play. <laughs> right. <laughs> so. I just want to give others an opportunity to, to put in their thoughts here or, or talk about maybe communities they've worked with where they've seen um, cuts being made or, or difficult decisions being made or have seen opportunities for integrating community resources, any of these topics, uh, please be feel, feel free to jump in and-, and uh, Yeah, I'd like to add, I, I have very parallel experiences. I'm glad you brought up the, the if you will, disincentive that you mentioned, Pip, um, because in some of the urban communities we're working in, we're right up against the, the they're already up against their maximum threshold, so there isn't the incentive to go the extra. But I am thankful that the MSBA requires, um, you know, lead or equivalent certified building. So, you know, mm -hmm. the, the fact that we've got that threshold is important, and it certainly puts pressure on us to make sure that we're um, finding ways to create healthy buildings and prioritize and and demonstrate, you know, no added costs or cost offsets. Um, but uh, to what some others were pointing out too, the community partnerships is something that I'm seeing that are really critical in, in a lot of our, particularly in our urban school projects. And sometimes the support space needed for those, the, we have some very unique urban school districts and those um, you know, extended kind of uh, community health spaces, or even um, in one case, um, the need for space to, to raise funds, to help support, um, some of the teaching staff and, and other things are a really important part of the success of the school and kind of the whole child approach. Um, it'd be nice to find a way to, to support those and not have those outside of, you know, fundable um, programs. I know I think that's really critical and it, it may be outside of the MSBA's purview to specifically do that as, as, as things are, are set up right now, but I don't think that means that there might not be other avenues for making sure those types of resources are um, available through the schools. It gets back maybe a little bit um, to what Rebecca was saying earlier about um, building community partnerships. Um, 
I think we've got to look pretty holistically at ways of solving these problems and you know, work with the MSBA and, and make sure we're getting optimizing that opportunity. But there may be other uh, avenues that need to be um, pursued as well. Laura, this is Katie Crockett um, with Lamarill Pagano Associates. I just I wanted to reinforce that in all of these comments. I think there's a great opportunity for MSBA to consider the reimbursement points relative to community partnerships um, in terms of going both ways. And I don't know, Jack, if you go back far enough with MSBA to comment, but I remember early on there were some opportunities to integrate community um, facilities within a school and that kind of got shed at some point. But I'm wondering if it's almost the opposite. Are there ways to um, reimburse for agreements with public libraries, park services, uh, that type of thing that would relieve some of the spatial issues that we have with these tight sites and create these synergies with already available uh, community resources? That might be something that would be mutually beneficial in some respect. Yeah, you know, like I said at the beginning, no bad, no idea is a bad one. Everything's on the table as far as I'm concerned. So happy to look into any of that stuff. Um, just on, on the reimbursement rate for the 80 percenters, um, that is something that I've had a lot of discussion with, uh, with Senator Lewis. So I would be shocked if that's not part of any kind of um, statutory reform that they'd be eligible for the uh, incentives you know, up to a certain point. But one, one thing, and I, I just want to say this out loud so everybody knows the reality of it. I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want, what I'm about to say, I don't want to put a wet blanket on any ideas, but just, just know in the back of your mind, there's only a fixed amount of money and everything that I change to give something to someone means that I'm going to have less money for something else. And so, you know, when you get in front of the legislature, they don't all, they don't all just represent you know the urban communities that we're talking about they represent the whole state and so that can be a challenge sometimes of getting them to agree to things that we all might think are uh, important and you know should be should be fixed but the reality for those individuals is that they have to go back to their districts every two years and get reelected and they you know so that they're in a yin yang there and so i and i don't want i don't want to what i just said i don't want to put a wet blanket on anything i just want everybody to realize that whatever we come up with we're probably not going to get it all so just just know that and I, I hate to be sobering sometimes but i think sometimes you have to be just to manage expectations no i and i think everybody is is aware of that but at the same time uh people as as uh you know taxpayers and uh, community members were also interested in what we can do. And Dory mentioned it in her, in her chat comment. Uh, are there ways that the, that the BSA are, are working together with other, um, other groups can, can bring pressure to, to the legislature? So it's not just looking to the MSBA to solve these problems, but using any political clout that we can muster to um, bring these types of things to uh, to our representatives and and use our political will uh, to raise awareness of, of the criticality of, of, of some of the issues that we've been talking about this morning so I, I, I totally understand your your the constraints that you operate within but um, I think there's also some there's the time we're in right now that there's a lot of um, interest in these issues and can we take advantage of the momentum that's out there now to uh, create some pr political incentive to, to focus on yeah. some of these. Yeah, yeah and, I'm, and I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. I just want to just give a little dose of reality. Yeah. But th there, will be, there will come a time when, when, when we'll, we'll be back here asking you guys to do exactly that. Uh, we're a little bit away from that, that time yet, as, as a matter of fact, the legislature doesn't really go back till J 
January. Um, so nothing would get filed, you know, prior to that. And I just, you know, I don't know how long it will take Senator Lewis and, and Representative Peich to digest what we're going to give them and, and come up with anything. So, but absolutely, there, there will be, you know, there will be a time when I will be asking for your help to do that. Laura, I'd like to address your your question from a different direction. As some of you may know, I'm on the designer selection panel. And obviously, you know, the allocation of funding is a top-down issue. But this is also a, I'll call it a bottom-up issue. If firms apply to do work from the MSBA, and in their cover letters, they say, we believe equity is an important issue and we are willing and able to address it. If in your section 10, you say, here are some strategies we can use as architects to address these issues. And if you come in to your interviews and say, we've done some conceptual sketches and we are prepared to address these issues, I believe you will have a receptive audience. And I believe it can trickle up as well as trickle down and I'm old enough to remember when accessibility was not an issue. And then it was an issue. I remember when sustainability was not an issue. And then it was an issue. So the question is, is 2020 the year when equity becomes an issue? And I do believe architects have the power not to allocate funds, but to put this issue on the table in the districts and at the state level and make things happen. So I am looking for the K through 12 committee. You can say, architects could say, we're gonna put this in our cover letter. You know, it's good for us as architects, it's good for everybody. So I encourage you to think as the people who are architects to think about this stuff. And I think that's a good point, David. Um, I mean, I think Matt uh, Denninger in his chat comment um, raises a really good point that while there are critical issues in urban areas, often there are rural communities that have, um, have significant needs as well. And I think obviously a, a critical issue when you, when you talk about you know, going out, if you can go after additional funding or, or making sure these resources are included, uh, certainly our perspective just in initiating this discussion really was um, about, started out really about racism. And there are, um, there, there's uh, significant needs in our state, uh, obviously. And, but just, I, I do think that for me personally, the, the racism piece is, is so, systemic and so um, long-standing that it, it seems to uh, have a, a, a priority in my mind in this particular, in this particular moment. Um, and it's not to say there isn't need across the state, but you look at the communities that are hardest hit by the COVID now, and it's, you know, it's Boston and, and Chelsea and Everett. Um, that are the, the heavily black communities uh, or Latino communities. Uh, so it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah no, it I, goes back to how, how do you allocate, if, how do you yeah, prioritize? No, and there's no, no easy answers. Right, and if I could just respond to that, like I think that, um, you know, in, in making, in making the, the point in the chat, um, I was, what I was trying to get at is you know, uh, a Holyoke is a very, I mean, Boston is always an outlier in like everything because they're, while they, while they do have a lot of, um, you know, minority students, they're also a, a fairly well-resourced district, whereas you go to, um, you know, a Holyoke and it's not so. And I think that there are, uh, on, the, on the issue of anti-racism, there are a lot of districts out there that we don't think of as having a lot of minorities that are starting to have a lot of minority kids and they can't pay, like even out in more rural parts of the state, we put Southbridge in receivership. Southbridge is a very rural kind of an area, but they have a, a, a big immigrant community, big um, 
poor non-white community. Um, and we're seeing this in a lot of, a lot of places, um, not, just, not just Southbridge in the middle of the state, but on the Cape, you're seeing, you're seeing some of these, these more, um, what we would consider sort of rural towns, they have high minority populations. So I think it's, I think it's important to, to take into account all of those areas and you know, what, what is their, what is their ability to actually come through with a project? You know, I've, I've talked um, with Jack and, and others, like I, I'm often worried about the districts that aren't applying to MSBA. Cause they're like, it's not even Absolutely. in our, like, what are we gonna, we couldn't even afford the 20%, um, you know, the, so I, th those are the places that, that, that you know, I, I wanna, Thing, and I know it's a I know it's a competitive grant program and that's that's how it how it is but I, I I do worry about those those places that are sort of off the map there's an example in Worcester that might be interesting to people I know Jack and Barb are very familiar with um, in Worcester at South High Community School where they have a community program called Andy's Attic. And I saw Phil had uh, sent in, uh, I believe it was Phil Quinelli sent in a note about that, a, a similar program. So it's uh, for a very underprivileged area where clothing is an essential. Many of the students that go to that school are homeless or extremely, uh, let alone uh, the low income. But what uh, the superintendent did was develop this program into a uh, technical program in the school. So it's a, it's a part of the curriculum and it isn't just a community service. So I think that's something that MSBA has embraced and it might be an approach in terms of programming and visioning with communities in terms of not just trying to provide these community services within a facility, but really wrapping them into the bigger picture of the curriculum development. I think that brings up a really good point um, in some of the schools, um, whether they be urban or suburban, being able to have space for those types of programs and having MSBA allow us to put those types of programs into the schools, you know, so we have schools that have, um, you know, places for food bank, uh, clothing, dental services, um, other health services. So just the ability to be able to expand what is, you know, not the typical space summary programs that are listed, I think is a good point. I think that we lost Laura here, but I'm um, just scrolling through the chat to see if there's any other. Um, I know Polly and others have been talking a little bit about how the school funding model works. And I don't know, Polly, if you want to unmute and, and discuss your comments here. I think those um, are with you. Yeah, yeah. I was just, you know, that was a discussion early on. Um, just about the inequities across the state uh, and across the country that we are maybe one of the only countries that sort of tie real estate taxes to uh, resources for schools. So, you know, this is the sort of radical transformation. You know, we're gonna radically transform the entire school day and the entire way schools work and all that. Let's radically transform the way they're funded and why can't they just be statewide? Why does it have to be tied to uh, the, the actual financial resources of each neighborhood. So anyway, just putting it out there. I don't, let me, and just as we talk about financial resources, there's the, the, the Boston model is an unusual one. And as has been pointed out already, Boston's a, a city that has a lot of, um, um, minorities, uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, people, economically disadvantaged and racially uh, disadvantaged people uh, in the school system. And yet it has lots of development going on, lots of uh, property taxes being collected. Every year, 
we see the reimbursement rate because of that at the, at the MSBA drop precipitously. But the um, ironic thing in Boston is that those people who the um, condo towers are aimed at and that the um, life sciences labs on, on the waterfront are, 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 are serving, those people do not send their kids to Boston public schools. And so you get, get which may be a un, unique situation in Boston, where you have a community that uh, probably has a lot of money coming in, but it has a very, um, uh, I'll say underprivileged school system that's in great distress it's uh, underserving in many ways um, its, um, its, its population, uh, even though um, it might in certain ways be seen as a very wealthy, um, financially solid uh, community. So I don't know if there are other um, comments uh, I, I think, I, I, um, David? I, I think Polly's issue, on some ways it's, in some ways it's on the periphery of this issue, and in some ways it's central to it. And I think the school funding, in some ways, is our Confederate flag. You know, that school district, uh, uh, that, that, that we're, uh, you know, local um, property taxes funding schools at some point, we will slap ourselves on the head and say, "How could we ever done it? Have done it that way? Why did we think this was not outrageous?" And I'm hoping that point comes. Um, and how it's connected directly to this, I don't know, but it may solve some of these problems we're talking about. I don't know if the BSA has weighed in on that issue, and could or should do it, but it it would be a great thing to do. Yeah, it's it's such a um, it's such a uh, a large reframing that I don't think we've begun to address it. But I agree, is it is it a reframing that, that needs to be part of the conversation? Uh, do we keep going with the same model, or is there a uh, are, are things dire enough in certain communities that this needs to be re re reconsidered? Uh, another comment, um, you know, at the beginning, there was some talk about the environmental impacts on urban school design, like the very real uh, notion that air pollution and acoustics and even, um, you know, hazardous materials are a big part of what you're dealing with in an urban design. And, you know, as we've heard some of these comments throughout the discussion, how, you know, it's also a lot of the urban schools that require increased services or other spaces that don't fit within the, you know, the neat box of like the space summary. And, you know, how are some other designers dealing with um, your districts and your communities to have these conversations about what to provide that you need to create a healthy environment and what you may need to cut that's an, an important part of the um, educational program? Yeah, and I, I, I do think that the, the way uh, it's structured, you, you're, many communities are not looking at, at the broader picture, that they're really looking at the educational program as the highest priority and everything else becomes secondary. And it's not necessarily a, um, in the long term the, the way it should be done, but I, uh, there, it, I think that's part of the way this system is currently structured that uh, educational program is is what's being funded uh, as, as I think I can't remember who was it brought up back 20 years ago there was set asides for community uh, programs in the old uh, SBA program um, but that that's not no longer a part of this this the structures it currently stands can I add to this Laura I Again, I know that Holyoke's one example, but I do feel like brought into this is, is the reality of white flight in districts like this. Um, a lot of our urban districts, um, a lot of families have left the public school system. 
Um, so even though the process, I think, is, is amazing for developing a really good um, school that has a lot of engagement in the design SD phase, um, it's after it gets out of that phase into the larger community, uh, you know, you try and get the community invested in the design process, but when many of the families that are going to have to opt to support the school financially are not invested in the public school system in, at all, um, there's a disconnect between those phases. And I've often wondered if there's a way to do that differently, um, you know, that's, that's structured into the process, uh, because I, I do have so much respect for how the process is set up to help engender a really well-designed school. Um, but I think that that is a real tension that's exacerbated in um, communities um, that are high poverty, high minority, um, where there's a history of white flight. Um, So, Laura, uh, this is Phil Pointelli. Uh, I just hi Phil. Hi, I uh, just want to um, uh, want to thank you for this conversation. Uh, the the um, problems are enormous in these school districts. Um, having uh, master planned in in Boston, Worcester, and Lawrence, um, the number of schools that we that are in very poor shape is is phenomenal, you know, and the conditions are phenomenal, the, the, the phenomenally poor, uh, with you know classrooms that have no ventilation other than the ability to open windows, toilets only in the basement of a you know three or four story building, uh, no gym, no cafeteria, no library, um, and and we're we're not talking about, you know, a few here and a few there. You know, in, in Boston, there are probably um, 60 or 70 in that category of their 127. Uh, at Worcester has has uh, a number of schools like that, certainly Lawrence as well. Um, and they're working on it, but the the problems are enormous. And, and how, uh, how, how do we get our society to, uh, address the enormity of that problem. Um, it's, 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 it's something that I think we as a uh, professional uh, organization should be uh, talking about, so. So just to, just to be another, and, and I hate to do Seems things. Seems like our discussion is kind of, go ahead, Jack, go ahead. So just to like fill the, the the sixty or seventy schools in Boston, right? That fit that. Just for just for a reality check here, just you know, if I if if, if I said tomorrow, all right, board of directors, we're going to attack the fifty schools in Boston. Well, that's probably the next five or six years funding for us. So nobody else gets to get another thing. And I just throw that out there just to for the example. And I'm 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 not. And I know that's not what you were asking, Phil. But I I always want to just bring people back to. You know, yep. we can't fix everything at the MSBA. And I know that you guys realize that, but I feel like I have to say that sometimes. I'm, I'm sitting here listening and I'm getting overwhelmed by all the things that no. we're talking about. And I'm no. like, I can't do it all. And it, it, this is all your fault, and, Jack. That's just something that I really have to deal with. And, 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 and Jack, uh, Jack, I understand that completely. I'm, yeah. I'm saying that we as a society need to... Um, begin to address these things yeah. and no, it just, uh, it's it, it you know um uh if 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 i had children uh that had to go to schools like that i would be outraged and but because they're in um uh, uh, underserved uh, and underrepresented and and under uh 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 funded communities they they uh uh, they can't all be addressed. And as I said, you know, all these districts are working at it and they're yeah. doing, they're doing great job. Uh, but uh, all I'm saying is that we as a society need to step up and help them more. And yeah. that's and I, all. And I went, I went, the Mozart school is exactly how you described it. That's where I, that was my first school that I went to in Boston. So, um, and no, I, I just, the reason, like, I like to be able to solve things and, when I'm hearing all this stuff, I'm like, I can't do all this, and it's bothering me. So that, that's what really I'm reacting to. So don't, don't okay. anybody take it for anything else. I think that's a great point. 
Uh, and I think that kind of just, it maybe is a, a bifurcation of this conversation, an important bifurcation of this conversation that needs to take place. And one is uh, what are the things that are important that uh, are achievable and we want to always kind of push the boundaries, but things that where we can work to make sure certain things happen uh, within the, the constraints that the MSBA has to work within and, and the funding as it currently stands. Uh, you know, how do we help to prioritize so that uh, we feel that things that need attention are getting the attention that they deserve? And then there's a second conversation, which is a, a kind of a broader, you know, as, as Phil says, more of a societal conversation. And um, you know, David said it as well, you know, that, that um, you know, are we, are we uh, apart from being school designers, are we, is our, is our society, is Massachusetts really approaching the, the um, uh, schools with the level of, of um, uh, funding and uh, importance that they deserve? And that's really outside of the purview of the MSBA um, directly. But I think it's an important conversation to be a part of and, and uh, keep that, that rolling on a second, on a second track. So um, I don't know if others have uh, things to say or if Tina and Bob want to wrap it up, but I really appreciate everybody's participation. I pay, particularly appreciate uh, Jack and others from the MSBA joining today to kind of uh, listen to us vent. <laughs> Um, and I hope that, that some productive, that I think that there's some productive ideas that we can focus in on here. Lord, Dave, I'd like to David, make one, one, quick, one quick point. This panel is the best imaginable tribute to Bernie Feldstein, the longtime mm -hmm. chair of the designer selection panel. He would be thrilled that this is happening, even more thrilled if it continues to happen. Um, Many, I don't know how many of you know him and, and, and that he died two weeks ago. This is exactly what he's been fighting for. So thank you so much for continuing the fight. Thanks. Good, good. Glad you brought that up, David. Yeah, thank you, David. So if anybody else has any points, if you want to talk. If I could just say, you know, don't please everybody know that I, I really am all ears. So don't take anything where I was being cautionary that I'm not fully engaged in this. So um, thank you to Tina and Bob as well. And, and Laura for, uh, you know, calling me up and starting the conversation. That's great. And so if there's, oh, I, if sorry, there's Pip, certain I things that, well. <laughs> if there's things that we can focus on as a group um, and come together again, maybe before the legislature goes back into session so that Maybe we prioritize some of the things that we've been talking about. As Jack said, you know, they're not going to be able to tackle all of these certainly, and maybe it's one thing that moves forward. So maybe um, Bob and I will get together and figure out when we can meet again and try to consolidate our list. I mean, everything we've talked about here this morning is is really important and interesting. You know, I especially like David's comments about how we as designers could address this in our question ten and bring it to our interviews and sort of bring it home in that personal way. Um, but I think we need more conversations and another meeting at some point. Absolutely. Do you have anything to add to that? No, I appreciate how big this conversation went. I, I appreciate Jack very much reeling it in. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of notes here too. And, and to echo, I think um, I've heard a lot of wonderful things, things that we can do that are, are, really just starting and, you know, focus on legislation. There are things that we can do, you know, as designers. And, and again, to repeat what uh, Tina said, um, David's comments, I think we need to make this part of the conversation, part of uh, when designer selection is happening, that it, it maybe is a factor, that it, um, we're bringing things to the table, we're bringing ideas to the table, and we're bringing focus to it. Um, and, I, and I like hearing a lot of the details and it I think break down. Go ahead, Laura. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to say that uh, uh, someone who brought up earlier, and I know Dory's in, involved, that the AIA Mass is also looking at these issues as well. So it's I, there's also some another at least one other forum where, where it's, it's just uh, being looked at broadly. 
as as well as A4LE, uh, and who has some uh, major efforts going on with this. And um, so I think uh, being able to collaborate as we have been uh, over the last number of years is a good ongoing thing. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a great point, Phil. Maybe we send out an invitation for that next meeting to um, the A4LE group so that they can participate as well. Really good point. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining us this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you, MSBA folks. Um, more to follow. Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.